Okay, uh, First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. Um, in the bulletin, there's a slight date mistake. Instead of the 16th of July, Brother Marvin, Miss Marvin will be here this weekend. And so let everybody know that we'll have Brother and Mrs. Marvin here Sunday school, Sunday morning and Sunday night. And uh, he calls me up as he normally would do. Uh, and he said, uh, Brother Fryer, are you ready? I said, for what? He said, uh, don't you know what this weekend is? I said, it's Sunday. He said, what else is it? I said, I don't know. Can you give me a clue? He said, am I not supposed to be there? I said, not till next week. He said, not on my calendar. I said, somewhere our calendars got mixed up. So they'll be here this weekend. And so we had a good time joking about it. And so I'm excited. It's always an exciting time to have Brother and Mrs. Marvin here. So they're, they're excited about coming. And so um, looking forward to that. So let people know. And I'll post it on Facebook or whatever to let everybody know that Brother Marvin and Adrian will be here this Sunday. So I'm excited about that. First Peter. Huh? No, sir. He doesn't use a projector. He just projects with his voice. That's all he does. Oh, he's very he's very good at projecting. He doesn't need a microphone. Yeah. I'm so so quiet in my speaking anyway, so <laughs> First Peter chapter one, look at verse seven says this. First Peter one seven says that the trial of your faith. Now what is a trial? Something you go through. When you look about it in a legal term, what's the purpose of a trial? Right, to be able to determine an outcome. That the trial of your faith. And as Peter is writing, he is using this legal term of trial with the idea is that whenever we go through problems, God is trying to bring up something uh, regarding our faith. It says, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Now, I don't know about you, I've never thought about my problems with the value of more than gold. Never thought about it that way. It was always, why am I having to go through this? This is a horrible situation, and, but I've never thought of it. I think about gold, I think it's positive, I think of it expensive, I think about it as valuable, but I don't look at that. And so we look at God's idea of our, of our faith. He's going to bring some things about through our problems that is of greater value than of gold. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't say that we're going to have an enjoyable time through our trials. And notice where we're going to literally see the end outcome of our trials at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So when is that for the believer? The rapture. So when we get to that rapture point, the very... Uh, exhibition of why we went through all those problems of all the situations will come about to show us what the expected end was meant to be. And so we're going to look at faith principles to build an influence. That we go through problems, God puts us through problems to help us to be better leaders and influence in people's lives. If there's one thing that we all can do is we can influence people positively or negatively. And so the very aspect of faith is used, is built up through problems. And so when you look at, when you look at the whole concept of the scriptures, what is one person that you could think of that eventually had a lot of faith through problems? Job. Job had a lot of problems. Big problems, not just family problems, but friend problems, circumstance problems, uh, possession problems. And then eventually he had problems with God because God said, uh, Mr. Job, were you with me when I created this earth? Where were you when I did this? Where were you? And so the very aspect of everything God was putting him through and it ended up for him, it says in chapter 42, that when he began to pray for his friends, things started changing. It took 41, almost 42 chapters, however long that is in days and minutes and hours, but however longevity is, 
it took him for that point to start thinking about other people. And sometimes those problems that God allows us to go through is for the purpose is to get our eyes off of ourselves and get our eyes on other people. Let me show you something. I'll tell you something. Uh, I get every once in a while about the uh, Christmas child. And this is what this young man says. He says, now Jesus lives in my heart, and I want to learn more about him, Marco said. I love Jesus with all my heart, and he will always be with me. Twelve-year-old boy that got saved. They have a bunch of prayer requests. That there is a tribal group called the Hmong Da community in Thailand that there are no known Christ followers. 36,000 people. And then there's one uh, community called Natiaro in Burkina Faso where of 5,600 people in that whole community, not one person that knows about Jesus Christ. And so you say, well, Man, they should know about Jesus. We've got technology and we've got this and we got that. They know about Coke. In fact, do you realize in, with the Coca-Cola recipe, no more than two people at a time know the formula. No more than two. And it's under lock and key and only two people know the combination. That's how much they value this formula. And yet the whole world knows about it. And yet as believers, there's population, there's groups and communities that have never heard about the name of Jesus Christ even one time. One preacher said it's like a marketing problem. We've not market, marketed Jesus like the world markets Coca-Cola. We've not gotten the word out to the extent of what it needs to. And God will use problems and trials and situations to cause us to come out of ourselves. To start looking at, man, this, when you go through problems, you get, you see the world in a di different point of view, don't you? And that's one of the reasons why we have this trial of our faith being much more precious of gold that it's tried by fire. Why? Because fire purifies. And so there's, there's, we're going to go through some different principles about that. First of all is faith's crucible principle. Crucible faith is learned in the crisis of a dark midnight experience when the leader is shut up to God only and surrenders selfishness and sin to totally depend upon God and find his direction and discover his power. Faith's crucible principle. So there's a principle that says God's going to get us alone and work on us to show us what is right in our lives and what is wrong in our lives and those things that we release that are wrong in our lives, he uses that and instills himself from those negative things in our lives to make us more effective as leaders. So I'll say, well, I'm not a leader. The definition of leadership is influence. Do you know of anybody that you influence right now? You live in a home, you influence people. You go to the store, you influence people. A job? Go to church. You're out in the community. You're at fireworks show. Whatever. Every one of us have some level of influence, whether we understand or recognize that. And if we begin to talk to people, we find out that there's more in common with one another than there is is of problems with other people because of this crucible thing. It's that God's trying to get people to realize that there's something more to life than the selfishness and petty things that we want in our lives compared to eternal values. Also, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Look at James chapter 1, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 12 says this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. See, part of the aspect about temptation or trial is endurance. He says, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. 
See, the aspect of our trials of endurance sometimes just brings us to a greater appreciation of who Jesus is. The fact is when we think about, well, no one understands what I'm going through. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 2 and 3 says this. Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. See, the joy that was set before him was way out here. In order for him to get the joy, he had to go through these different hurdles and these different circumstances to get that point of joy. It's kind of like a runner. A runner practices and prepares and um, takes care of themselves and pushes themselves for one purpose and one purpose only, to cross the finish line. For the joy that was set before Jesus was that he would go through these different things with the purpose that when he crossed the finish line, there would be many other men, women, and boys and girls Accept what he went through for them. Continue reading on, it says this. For the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now look at verse 3. It says, for consider him. He says to look to him, and while we're looking to him, he says consider Everything he's done. Despising the shame. Enduring the cross. Who endured such contradiction as sinners against himself. He was poor. He was rich, but made himself poor. He was righteous to make the unrighteous righteous. He became sin for us who know no sin. He became a curse for us who was curseless. Consider it, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So it says, look to him, look to everything that he did. That's why the, the aspect of going through the school of Christ is so monumental as we look at Christ's life through the four Gospels. And they're all just nothing but snapshots of different things about Jesus' life. But what we can learn is a lot of information. And Hebrews, the Peter, a Paul who writes Hebrews says, okay, now you're looking to him and you see the grand scheme of things. Now he says, consider him because now you're allowing that to sink in to think he did that all for me. Who endured that? Jesus said, I thirst. How would you feel if you had nothing to drink for several hours? Now, literally, the blood was pouring out of his body. The pain of, um, they said that his, his bones and joint they were out of joint. But not broken, that's right. The crown of thorns into his head. The beating of the 39 lashes by the cat of nine tails. Through all of that, then walking up the Via Della Rosa, totally naked in total humiliation. And then getting up to the top and then laying down, willingly laying down and letting them stretch out his arms and putting the nails into his hands and into his feet. And to think about all that pain, I'm sure the most hurtful thing was that as he was looking across the crowd, the very people that he came to save and to love and to cherish and take care of, they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And yet through all of it, he says, Father, forgive them for, I know, for they know not what they do. And then when they, he said, I thirst, they took a sponge of vinegar. I don't know about you, but I don't like the taste of vinegar or chugging any type of vinegar. But literally, can you imagine the pain of the, the trying to the, let that stuff hit the sores on the lips and the body and the face? Can you imagine all that pain? That's why he says, consider him. Consider him. 
consider all that he did to forgive him. He said, I'm a, I'm, today that shall be with me in paradise. Mom, there's John. John, you take care of mom like she's your own mom. Mom, you take care of John just like he's, he's your own son. And he looks at heaven and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And through all of that, we need to consider. We need to think about and meditate. Have we ever gotten to that point of going through such humiliation and not just physical pain, not just emotional pain, but psychological pain and rejection and all that? The very people that you loved and taught for three years, oh, we're not going to leave you. And you look down, where are they at? They're gone. Consider him. That's part of this crucible principle is the fact that the trying of our faith bring much more precious than the gold that is tried by fire. The crucible, faith's crucible principle. But then also, there's a transferable faith principle. The expression of faith found in great leaders can be communicated to aspiring leaders by example. Look at Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. You see, when we are, as we are learning, it is our job to spread the, the knowledge to other people. Pass the torch, pass the baton. Let other people know of what you have gone through. That's why we're supposed to speak and tell people, to share our lives with other people, and give those life examples to, to associate with people. I listen to a lot of different people at uh, where, where I work at. In my office just down the hallway, there are all kinds of stories. And then a lot of them come down my hallway there, and then they go into the little cubby holes. They're supposed to be offices, but they're more cubby holes. And then when they come out of it, a lot of times, uh, about two weeks ago, I had a box of snacks. And this, this husband and wife, and they had a couple little kids, they must have been in there for an hour. And can you imagine two little kids in the cubby hole for an hour? <laughs> they're screaming, and, let me out of here. And I've been, I just, and they're going back and forth. And mom and dad's because they're embarrassed. They don't want to be looking bad because I'm in front of the workers, stuff like that. And they open up the door, and they saw the snacks. Well, guess what those kids did? They attacked it. And the mama says, no. I said, let them go. She said, but you're, I said, it's gonna, not going to hurt these kids. In fact, it's going to help you because once they get a little food in their belly, it's going to knock them out. <laughs> you get a child that uses so much energy, they just get something to be in their bellies, kind of like a cat, get up curled like in the sunshine, and then they're out for a long time. And when they were done, as they were leaving, she was thanking me and thanking me, and the dad says, we didn't expect that. I said, didn't expect what? Our ki I said, they're kids. This not, it didn't hurt me to lose a few snacks. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, what's that? Can I have a snack too? <laughs> <laughs> Take two. <laughs> you look like you can use it. Mom, yeah. No, I'm good. I got to get these kids out of here. They're driving me nuts. But the very action of, if I... What would have told them if I'd have gone nuts over a couple of snacks? That those inanimate objects that were meant that were made to be eaten anyway was more important than satisfying two little kids who had just felt cooped up and just needed some something to feel good about themselves. It doesn't matter. And after they left, my boss came down and she said, What happened? I said, I'll tell you later, boss. And after a little bit, she said, what did you do? I said, I didn't do nothing. Those kids attacked that thing like vulture on roadkill. I mean, just. <laughs> and she said, you let them have it? Yes. She said, good. Because it lets those kids know that they're more value than something as stupid as a snack. And. We've got to understand that when you have a hurting society, something like they say, that doesn't mean anything to them. I can tell you, man, something to mama. 
Because instead of hearing an hour of screaming, yelling, they're not talking. They're leaving a trail of crumbs of stuff on the floor. But that would much rather deal with that than to deal with kids screaming and yelling and not, when am I going to get the food and stuff like that? Be quiet. I'll get something at home. And then the dad was happy because he was hungry too. I know it's like to sit in those, those meetings for an hour and the stomach's growling and you're not thinking about that what they're saying in front of you. You're only thinking, man, I need some food. But to me, it meant more to me than to, to watch those little kids. I mean, they were smiling and they were just so excited about getting those snacks. And, and I just looked at dad and I mean, he just, just he couldn't wait to get those snacks either. But we've got to understand, if hurting people are hurting people, and if there's this broken heart behind every door, how many times have you been hungry and someone's been kind to you to give you something? It's a matter of passing it forward, but it's a matter of remembering of being in their shoes and someone said, you know what? You're more of value to me than those things. Let me give this to you and encourage you, even if it's just a little bit. And so when you're talking about transferable faith, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans 1, 17 says this. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith or their faith. And we have got to have a type of faith that is not just found in the four walls of this church, but a faith that is seen outside the four walls that ministers to people. And it doesn't have to be a lot. A lot of times it doesn't have to be spiritual, but it encourages them. I'll give you another example. Yesterday we were up here and uh, going to do some work out, out front. And some of the Spanish church, they had come up to have a little breakfast on the 4th of July. And I walked in there. I wanted to kind of see what's going on because I heard voices back there. And I wasn't going crazy because actually people with those voices. And I walked in there and they had this nice spread of food. And they said, Pastor, come here. I said, no. I pointed at my belly. Uh-uh, no. <laughs> and, and then uh, I started walking away and I said, Pastor, come here. I want to show you something. And I turned around and then made these homemade chicharrones, which is um, these pork rinds, homemade. And so I said, no, 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 no. Pastor, beans and, and beans and bacon and ham. Okay, I'll sit down for just a minute. <laughs> and it, I mean, those ladies lit up like a Christmas tree. And for them, and you know when you have something like that, I, I, I always remember that Lucinda would want to have, I mean, she'd want to have a lot of people when she cooked. And to her, she'd just sit down at the table, and everybody else, man, they're putting the potatoes and gravy and the corn and, the, uh, uh, and then eating all this stuff up. Why aren't you going to eat? She says, I just want to sit back and enjoy watching you eat. To her, there was no greater joy than for her to go through all that work and to see literally people enjoy all those hours of preparation. And so when you live your faith, it's a matter of living what means to you, what God means to you, into a world that may not understand who God is. And so when it's, tr when it's transferable, it's a matter of sharing what we have, the just shall live by faith. But then also, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says in verse 14, but continue, sorry, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, 
which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So literally he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. It's, it's, the Christian life is a series of repetition of learning and practicing and reinforcing and learning and then passing it on, then reinforcing and passing it on. That's, but continue thou in the things that thou... So continue from the time that you first come to Christ until when? Until God takes us home. But also, he says, which I've been assured of, knowing of whom you have been, thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the aspect of being faithful of what we've learned, but remember, what we basically have learned is what the Bible has taught us. That's why I tell people, Every one of us has the ability to proclaim the word of God, even if we've been in church for one or two weeks. Because we're not expected to know a whole system of theology. We're expected to share what we know. I'll never forget Maria in Chicago. She was a little five-year-old, and she used to ride her Sunday school bus. And we'd walk her. We got to the First Baptist Church of Hammond, and we drop off at the different buildings. And my my role was to take the children to the Spanish to the Spanish ministry. And so Maria was always first. She always held my hand, and literally we would sing every week, "Jesus loves me," in Spanish. And then Maria, why do you sing that? Because Jesus loves me. And although a five-year-old, that's the only song she knew, but she was continuing in the things that she had been taught. So that's not much. I think singing Jesus Loves Me is, is a, speaks volumes compared to a whole system of knowing um, the different aspects of what the Bible says. Because you can get so lost in knowledge of the Bible that you get nothing accomplished. But if you Go on and continue the things that you have been learned. It gives you familiarity. And the more familiarity you have, the more confidence you have. And the more confidence you have, the more boldness that you have. It's a step-by-step -step progress. So the aspect of transferable faith is that you've been taught something. Take what you have and share it. Then as you learn more, then go a little farther. But don't forget where you started at. And then always remember, that's why if you're in this church at any time, you're going to hear what my, birth, my spiritual birthday is. February 4th, 1979. So why do you say it so much? Because to me, that was the start of my Christian walk. And I always go back to that. And when I go back to Florida, I will always go back to the church. I may not be able to get inside because it's the wrong time or whatever, but I'm always go back to that church. And I'm going to always remember what happened inside that church. I'm going to always go back when I go to Florida. I'm going to go back to the place that I rode the first, the first time riding a Sunday school bus. I'm going to go back to that time. Then I'm going to go from North Fort Myers all the way across North Fort Myers to Cape Coral and to where the country club is. And I'm going to go to the place that um, was where my brother drowned. And my life drastically changed after that. I'm going to always go back to that. Why? Because I, those are steps in my Christian life. And I always go back to those things I remember. I go back to the canal when my brother drowned, but also on the other side of the, of the canal is about a $10,000 record that I threw in the water because I, I felt like God wanted me to get rid of it. I think about that thinking, well, was it worth Throwing that record, back then it, I thought it was until so my mama found out that I did it. And then when I found out after they had a revision, I redid that one, and I went from 500 down to 10,000, I was thinking, that's a lot of money. But the amount of money compared to how my Christian life grew, because I made that separation, is a value to me. And so I try to retrace those steps and always go back and remember where I come from. 
And as a believer, we want to always go back to where we came from, from the time of our spiritual birth, and then relive those things. There's nothing wrong with reliving them. Some don't live in there all the time. And use that to, to realize what we're, how'd you grow? I'm thankful for those opportunities. And it's transferable because every time I've been down there and I've had different people with me, I always go through the same place. I go through the same stories. And I just, I tell them and let them know, this is where I came from. And this is where I'm at right now. But there's a lot of, a lot of steps that took me from Sun Coast to States to Pittsburgh, Kansas. But I'm thankful for those different, different aspects of it. And so we share our lives, and as the Bible says, as a tale that is told. We li Literally, we're writing a book every day of our lives. And in the end, who's going to read that book? The people that go on after us. Because as long as we're living, there's more added to the book. So we aspect about our faith, it should be transferred because of what we've been taught, who we've been taught, circumstances that taught us. But then also, so we look at this crucible principle, we look at this transferable faith principle, but then also the faith and vision principle. Faith involves seeing a need and determining a plan, how God wants that need to be met, and as the plan becomes reality, both faith and vision grow. Got to go back to about 2017 with Mrs. Wise's Christmas shoe boxes, and I've told the story how she literally guilted me to the point of I'm not going to quit talking about it till at least we try. But mom, you don't understand how I, feel. I don't care. What does God want? Is God more important than your feelings? I hate it when she was right. Her being a preacher's wife didn't help my case because she knew more about the Bible than I did. And she had lived more about the Bible than I did. But as I presented the church, and honestly, I think, man, this will not work. And here we are six years later, gone all over, boxes all around the world, and I read about those different places. I said, Lord, that'd be a great place for our shoe boxes to go. Can you work it out? Lord, can we be a part of, 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 a, of a shoe box ministry of reaching boys and girls and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles that have never heard the name of Jesus once? Can you allow us to work that out? Lord, that would just be amazing. It's having the vision, working through it, and as God begins to open up the opportunities, our faith continues to grow. And I can tell you that when we start talking, every year we start talking about that, I see an excitement in people's eyes. It's like an anticipation. We're finally getting to get to here, kind of like Christmas. We got a week. We got five days. We got three days. We got one day. We're not opening any presents till Christmas morning. But what about Christmas Eve? We got to wait till Christmas Day. And then we got to wait till mom and dad said it's okay to go unlock the, open up the presents. The anticipation builds up until finally you start ripping up paper and things start flying around and you get that, get all those different gifts, stuff like that. And I know when we were kids, Dad used to say, I should have just wrapped up plain old boxes because you play with the boxes then more than the toys. But it's an anticipation. That's what a vision is all about. It's about an anticipation of saying, God, what can you do? What will you do with my life? How are you going to work in my circumstances to see your will being done? So it's the, the recipro reciprocity of faith and vision. Uh, Proverbs 29 and 18 says, Without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision of seeing these, these people. I, I, was, I was thinking about that all day. Um, of kingdom, I just cannot imagine. Of a, a, in this day and age, 
where there's literally, if you ask someone who is Jesus, for them to say, who's he? I can't imagine that. But literally there are multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes of people that don't have the technology. No one's even reached them. No one's even cared about them. Now all of a sudden, it's on someone's radar. Please pray for these groups that we've just heard about. And there's this many people that have never heard, never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And I thought, Lord, would you please? That'd be so exciting. Lord, and as I've seen different videos of literally them smuggling Christmas shoe boxes in through darkness in boats and in camels and in donkeys and in um, ox pulled carts to get people to hear about Jesus Christ for the very first time. And the more I think about it, the more it excites me to think we may not have all that, but we have what we have, and we're going to use every bit that we have because I want those boxes to be smuggled in the, in the night to be able to, hear, to have people to hear about Jesus Christ for the very first time in communist countries. I want that. And I may not be able to know the results, but one day I will. And that's that eager anticipation. Lord, I can't wait to find out what this round of boxes is going to do for your honor and glory. How, as a pastor, I get a chance to share with what you're doing. Lord, let me see this. I can be able to share it and excite people. Saying, well, this is what we did this year. This is the group of people we saw. I mean, literally, we have churches established through the shoeboxes in Pittsburgh, Kansas, to our church. And our church has a testimony in the receiving station as one of the largest Christmas shoeboxes of groups of all of Southeast Kansas. So we're a small church. We got a big God. We got people with a big heart who pray and sacrifice and work for every shoebox that is there. To me, that's what I want to see. And that's why when I first got here, um, Brother Novak, and that picture's still on the wall, when I first came here, is the first mission that came, and he says, I want to present this. What is this? This is the, the first church that, because of this church supporting me, took up a special offering. This church is a, is a representation of the giving that your church has done. First time I was the first as a pastor, being a pastor. So I keep it up there, always remembering that, what the work of God is doing all around the world, whether we see it or not. And so I think about all the missionaries that we have. Sarah Bradley just celebrated her first year in, um, in Eastern Europe. And the boys and girls that she's ministered to and the Bibles and tracts and all the different things in ministry she's done, you have a part in that. And so when you look at the aspect of um, having a vision, but also obedience brings blessings. Look at Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Look at verses 15 and following. Acts 26, verse 15 through 19 says this. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. This is the, the, he is testifying about what happened on the Damascus road. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things, which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And look at verse 19. This is what he, he says. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient of the heavenly vision. Obedience. So when I saw Jesus and he told me who he was, he said, this is what you're going to do. I've been doing that. And as I testify to you, I've not been disobedient to what God told me what I was supposed to do. 
Just obedience. Just do what you're supposed to do. We make life so difficult when we try to infuse our own will and what God wants us to do. I've said this many times. When I was a child, if I would only learned that principle of just do what they wanted to do, how they wanted it done, and when they wanted it done, and didn't say anything, my life would have been a lot happier, and I would not be hurting as much as what I did when I was a child. All I do is obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Just trust and obey. So this aspect of faith and vision is a necessity uh, about a vision. There's an obedience which brings blessing. And so when you think about this, this vision, this church started as a vision oh, 51 years ago. A vision. And only the Lord knows how many souls have been impacted in 51 years, not just here, but around the world. It's amazing. And that vision that was started, it continues. And it will continue. Because as long as we have breath in our lives, then we have a commitment to follow through with that commitment. We're, we're required to follow. The baton is being passed. It is so very important to understand that all of us in whatever role we have, we are leaders. And take that leadership role, not as having the big head or being haughty or prideful, but take that position in the role that God has given to you and do the best in your position to the glory of God and let God take care of the rest. And that's the way it is. So when you talk about faith, these are, these, these are basic principles We've heard, been in church any amount of time, you've heard these same principles just named differently. But the fact is, however they are named, it still doesn't change the fact that it still comes from the same word of God, which never changes. What an amazing God we serve, amen? Well, praise the Lord, God is good. Okay, let's take up some prayer requests. Yes, I pray for you. Okay, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, okay. Yes, she's going to New York. She's going to need lots of prayers, lots of angels protecting her. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll definitely pray for that that moderator. Pray for your missionaries. All the stuff going around the world, many of them are dealing with a lot of stuff we may not even know about. So definitely keep them in your prayers. Pray for the services. Like I said, um, Brother Marvin will be here this Sunday, not next Sunday. And so just pray for the Lord's will to be done. And uh, let's just let people know. Um, I will tell you that of all the different missionaries and everything, I would say Brother Marvin... Is probably the closest friend that I have in the ministry, Brother Marvin is. And so I'm very thankful for him and his friendship and his love for our church. Yes, ma'am. Sure. We'll just pray for, for that unspoken. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, my nephew told me that um, they, somebody had offered to cash for the house. Uh huh. Right. Yes. Need to have that off your plate. Yes. Get rid of that thing. So yes, I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand. We'll definitely pray for this transaction that it goes well yes. and uh, it, one less thing to worry about. That's what we want. Okay? 
Pray for services that God would bless them. Okay, anybody else before we go to the Lord in prayer? I hope. Yes, ma'am. I hope my mom had my uncle or my uh, grandpa's old bug. Okay. My grandpa passed away and oh, no. this um, classic Volkswagen bug. Okay. They need to get that plant at home. Sure. We'll definitely pray for that. Okay. Anybody else before we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. There's no other prayer request. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, casting our cares upon him, for he cares for us. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you tonight as needy people. We ask, Lord, that you be with the many prayer requests, ones that have been spoken, ones that have not been spoken, ones that just need you to intercede in a special way. Lord, There's uh, we have possessions, we have loved ones, we have folks traveling. Lord, we, we know of folks that are not feeling well. We know of folks who have lost loved ones. I think about one of my preacher friends out in western Kansas whose um, father-in-law passed away. And Lord, I pray with all the things they've been going through, I pray you'd comfort them. Lord God, we know that you are everything that we could ever need or ever want. And Lord, we thank you for that you never change. We thank you for the word of God and how much it means to us. And thank you for allowing us to be in your house and living in this great country and giving us the freedom to be able to attend church without having to worry about the government or anything like that. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you give us safety tonight. Watch over us. Lord, we pray that you bring us back to the next appointed hour. Bless Brother and Mrs. Marvin as they travel from Denver uh, on, on Thursday night. And, Lord, bless them in a special way. Keep them safe. And maybe have a great service this weekend. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Good night, Lord willing. We'll see you on Sunday.